is there are multiple channels on which the communication is happening and each one of the channels we are looking at the transmit portion okay so let me explain the the motivation behind this so this is the way um, the cable modem hardware looks like so there are different channels channel 1 channel 2 channel 3 uh, channel n and all these are carrying data so whenever you are doing something on your computer all that data is getting spread around in all these uh, different channels okay and then it gets modulated and after modulation that data is uh, converted to analog okay so all this stuff that's happening here it's all in the digital domain and then you go through d2a converter and the d2a converter um, will create a an analog signal and that analog signal you are combining for all the different channels and that's what is uh, sent out on the cable uh, you know output and on the other side you receive it and then uh, do you ship back uh, you know if you clicked on a mouse then uh, or you selected something then that data is shipped back to the uh, cable modem on the other side all right so with that outline one of the main issues here is each one of these d2a converters okay they are uh, basically the data that's coming in is ofdm okay ofdm means it's uh, orthogonal uh, frequency division multiplexing what that means is each channel consists of whole bunch of tones like this okay and each one of the tones has uh, you know its amplitude is going up and down up and down and that's your modulation okay and this particular uh, let's say for the, for example channel 1 uh, if it has uh, if the the dac uh, that we have over here if it's non linear okay then you get uh, second second harmonic third harmonic and things like that right and you can get uh, other components like intermodulation distortion so we are not going to talk about that right now so for example um, for this particular uh, channel 1 i could get a um, spur spurious spectrum that looks like this okay and then there will be another uh, you will have another uh, this is your third harmonic something like that okay now these are bad okay because they line up in the other spec other band like for example in this case it lines up in the channel 3 and then the channel 3 is screwed up so that's not good so as a result of which there are really stringent specs on these d2a converters linearity specs okay and uh, so uh, this pay this particular paper kind of teaches you how to how to how to design a d2a converter uh, which has excellent linearity and it kind of walks you through the same concepts i did um, in the previous lecture about uh, thermometer dac binary dac segmentation and the trade offs between the two but it's very well articulated in this particular paper so that's why i like this paper and i would i would like all of you to make an effort to read this paper from beginning to end in one sitting and take down your notes okay um, because that's what is important um, the one one piece of advice i'll give you uh, since many of you are in the graduate uh, school right so even if you are not going to work in circuit design you may be working in physics or whatever uh, your field of uh, expertise is it's extremely important to read a paper and start taking notes you have to have your uh, like i like to call it your baby book or some kind of book that you treasure and in that book you write down the key details of the paper because if you read a paper and you get something out of it uh, that will evaporate in about 2 days from your brains and you will not remember it on the fourth day okay so it's important to write down notes key highlights for each paper um, so that uh, you know you have spent so much time reading the paper then it's important that you retain that information in your own words in a notebook and then uh, the investment the time investment that you did in the reading the paper will stay with you okay so it's a general piece of advice it doesn't matter which field you are going to work in you may be working in digital you may be working in ic fabrication but uh, it's kind of critical to write your own notes and i would i would advise you to read this paper and then do your own notes uh, so that you kind of get into this habit all right so with that um, let's kind of move on to um, what i was talking about so for example in this particular case uh, this is the fundamental um, uh, that we were 
you know we were transmitting and this particular um, you know bump that you see here is something that's undesired that's happening because our DAC is not linear and um, they the the way it's defined is spurious free dynamic range so this particular um, spectrum it's called spurious spurious means it's unwanted and also the the word spur is is something that you should be scared of because once the spurs are starting show show up in your uh, spectrums then they are very difficult to debug so um, you you want um, and this particular case we can see that the spurious free dynamic range that we're going to get is 47 db so it's a reference to the main spectrum that we want so how far the undesired spurs are from the desired ones uh, and that's the way it's, it's expressed in the db references uh, to the to the desired one all right so what did they do to do this design okay so they wanted to design something that's 50 db uh, you know sfdr so if you read here you will see okay they wanted uh, sfdr of 60 db for example okay and they had certain uh, sample rate here which is 200 mega sample per second that's what they wanted and um, so how did they do it okay so so first they started with uh, analyzing uh, binary weighted DAC. okay and this has pretty much uh, what we discussed uh, last time. If you if you see this um, on your screen, at the mid code transition, okay, where zero one 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 to one zero zero zero, okay, so that's like the most significant bit, um, you know, in the binary uh, uh, binary weighted DAC. Um, you will you will pretty much switch all the current sources. So all the LSB or MSB minus one onwards to z uh, zero, the, the LSB, you will switch them off and then you will turn on the MSB. So in this particular case, all the all the current sources are exercised. As a result of which you get the maximum glitch. And if your matching is not good, then you can uh, you know you can get non-monotonic uh, behavior. Okay, non-monotonic mean um, you may think that you will get a um, when you go from 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0, 0, you will think that you'll get a positive step. But then sometimes you can get a negative step because of the mismatches. And that is non monotonic. And that's generally not a good idea because uh, that will really mess up your design if you have non monotonic design. Okay. So uh, again, reiterating at mid code, um, all the switches are switching simultaneously. So uh, that would give you the glitch. Okay. So let's see what that glitch looked like. Okay. So if you look uh, look here, okay. So you can see uh, you're going from zero to one zero two four, okay, because it's a ten bit back. And if you do all binary, then any time the MSB or MSB's uh, MSB minus one or MSB minus two, it gets flipped, then you get these glitches, and you can see the glitch here. So this glitch basically signifies, uh, you know, how how this thing is working, um, and you get a DNL which is pretty large in this particular case. It can be one LSB here in this case. It can be minus two LSB also. Okay. Let me go back to then um, where I was. Okay. So this kind of shows you um, how the binary DAC is designed. So these are all uh, current sources. Here you can see there is a bit zero and that bit zero switch. It will it will switch current I. Then you have current two I. Similarly, you have, have two to the power A. So all these currents, they are being switched, um, you know, according to the, the DAC input bits which are coming. And as you can see, when you look at the DNL, DNL is worse at the at the center point and then um, it will be, um, you know, you can see it's again the next worst part is here, which is MSB minus minus one, and then the next one will be MSB minus two. Okay, so these are the the switching uh, glitches that you're going to see. Okay, um, are you all able to hear me? And is the network? The, I'm getting some things about network quality here. Uh, Pawan, can you hear me? Okay, and can you see me? Okay. Yes, sir. All good. Sir, all good. OK, all right. Um, so uh, the other issue with this 
is the glitch. OK, uh, think about this. Um, you may have a signal that that is going from um, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And you have a very small signal, one LSB signal, and it's just going back and forth. Something like this. Let's imagine that. What will happen? Even though my signal is only one LSP, since I'm switching so many, uh, so many current sources back and forth, OK, you will end up getting a large glitch. And that large glitch is kind of, uh, it depends on the code where you are. OK, now that's not good because that will cause uh, a lot of unwanted things in your spectrum. You will, um, you will see, uh, you know, distortion that's frequency dependent and things like that, uh, code dependent performance, and those are not good things, OK? specifically for high performance DACs. So what what's going on in binary DAC is, uh, you know, the. The glitch. The magnitude of the glitch is proportional to the number of switches that that are actually switching, not the amplitude of the signal, but number of switches, and that is a problem when it comes to binary DAC. OK, so um, so that is th these are the issues we discussed earlier in our uh, in our uh, previous lecture, but I just wanted to show you, you know, it's nicely summarized in this particular uh, paper. The next thing we're going to talk about is the thermometer deck. OK, so um, in thermometer deck, what's really going on? So if you look at a thermometer deck, this is like a good uh, representation of a thermometer deck. Here we have a binary input coming in. OK, and you have so many current sources, for example, uh, over here. To the left and to the right. Okay, so it's a differential DAC. So um, you 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 switch the current either to the left side or right side. Okay, back and forth. And in the middle, you will have switch uh, currents in the center. Um, so you take a binary input, and then all these current sources are exactly same value. Okay, unit cell value. And um, then you have this binary to thermometer code, and this will decide, um, you know, which uh, unit needs to be turned on and off. That's what it will do. So in this particular case, in case of thermometer DAC, what happens is uh, at a time you're only switching one particular uh, branch, okay, one unit, um, and as a result of which the 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 matching requirement is greatly reduced because now it's one LSB uh, that needs to match up to half LSB. So you only need matching of fifty percent, okay. Now some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, you may get a little bit confused. Why is he saying that? You know, read the paper. OK, so it's it's delved into great details uh, for your understanding. So the key point is what I'm going to discuss in the lecture today. So what it's showing here is in case of thermometer DAC, if I have um, basically if I have a one LSB, then I have one unit of switching. But if I have four LSB output, then I have four units of switching. OK. So having having the glitch, uh, the glitches are unavoidable. OK, so you have to live with them because every time you do switching, you will get glitch. But if the glitch is proportional to the amplitude of the signal, then we are OK, because for a large amplitude, if I get some glitch, but for small amplitude, I get very small glitch. I'm good because then um, then I get I can deal with that. You know um, what matters is the, the ratio uh, or a fidelity of your desired signal versus the glitch energy. Uh, OK, so the glitch energy, if it's small for small signal, then we are good. We are OK. Whereas in the case of binary DAC, that's not the case. Binary DAC, it doesn't depend on the on the signal amplitude. What it depends on is at any point, how many uh, how many uh, of the current sources are being switched? And that is dependent on where you are in the code. OK, if you are in the middle of the code, then you get maximum glitches. All right. So now that uh, we kind of looked at that uh, in thermometer DAC, basically, uh, as I said, the glitches, you have an advantage and in binary DAC glitches is a bad news. Um, so now uh, we kind of look at the layout aspect of it, right? So for example, in this particular case, you can see um, the thermometer DAC would be one current source at a time that you would keep increasing as the code goes up, whereas in the in the binary case, you will uh, depending on the code, you will turn on the corresponding MSB minus one, MSB minus two, 
and, and on and on like that. So what they did is a pretty good uh, MATLAB simulation where all these current sources have a random variable, each one of them, and then they um, they kind of summed up the result. And the result kind of shows nicely for you. Um, in case of the thermometer, the DNL is so tiny, just what we expect. Okay. And in case of binary, we already discussed the result, right? You get a pretty crappy result. If you have completely binary DAC, 10 bit DAC, then um, then you will you will get these uh, glitches at the center point code. All right. Uh, the the bottom part here is INL. Uh, doesn't matter thermometer or binary. It it looks about the same, and that's what we talked about in the previous lecture, because um, the the INL is dependent on not the architecture but actual matching performance of the cells. OK, so the better the matching performance due to process or the way you have laid things out, the better the INL would be. All right. Now this one pretty much is showing if you do RMS additions, then uh, this is what you get. OK, so this kind of say repeats the same result and it shows here that in case of um, thermometer, you have one sigma. Uh, which is sigma of one unit cell, and in case of binary, you have 32 sigma. Okay, um, your um, your standard deviation. Okay, so this is for the 10 bit DAC, and uh, we already studied that in the in the previous lecture. Okay, whereas the INL would be 16 sigma and 16 sigma in both cases, which is what you get. Okay, so this is kind of proven with the MATLAB simulation. Um, if you're going to work in this space. Um, Whenever it comes to uh, you know mixed signal design, uh, you don't depend just on cadence simulation, transistor level simulations. You have to uh, use a lot of MATLAB uh, to model all these effects. And uh, the modeling, the random variation in MATLAB will give you a lot of clues in terms of how do you partition things in your circuits. So uh, the MATLAB modeling is, is one of the important tools that you should use. And that's why we were asking you to do the MATLAB simulation in the in the very first uh, uh, assignment itself. OK, all right. So now let's move to um, the next important aspect that I would like to tell you about is. Um, this particular graph. So what we are uh, the key point that you need to remember, there is a landmark paper by Pelgrom. OK, uh, that you can look at what this paper tells you is if I if I put two elements on a chip, how well do they match? OK, and what can I do to improve the matching between those two those two elements? Could it maybe capacitor, maybe resistor or maybe uh, maybe even a um, transistor or any other element, right? So what his uh, conclusion that's been used by all of us for last almost 30, 40 years and which has been um, verified in every process is the following. Basically, if you increase the area of your device, OK, then you get better matching. So for example, if you have certain standard deviation uh, of sigma um, and uh, for a certain area, let's say A. So if A gives you, A1 gives you uh, standard deviation of sigma 1 in terms of matching, of a particular device, right? Let's say resistor value or a capacitor value. Then if I make, if I increase the area by factor of four, okay, if I make it four A1, then the standard deviation will be sigma one divided by two. Okay, so that's the important result. And we have seen this work very well. And, um, you know, that's what we've been using uh, for, for so long. Um, okay, and it's kind of proven by, uh, whenever you do any any chip design. Uh, OK. OK, so um, what this is telling telling us is how do I. Um, what we are trying to do in this paper is you have a binary DAC and you have a thermometer DAC and how do I trade off between the two? Because if I go to binary DAC, uh, then I'm going to get a really crappy performance in terms of DNL. If I use a thermometer DAC, I'm going to get a great performance. In terms of uh, perform, in terms of the DNL, DNL, right? So then, um, if I just do the binary DAC and simplify all my connectivity, then I will have to increase the area of each element in the binary DAC to improve my DNL. 
and every time I increase the area of by factor of four, I get an improvement in standard deviation by factor of two. So you can imagine how large that binary DAC has to be to get a comparable performance uh, to a thermometer DAC. Okay, so that's the key point I'm trying to tell you. Now, if you look at this particular chart, it will tell you a really nice story. Okay, so let's study this. And this is kind of the way the research is done. And, uh, you know, um, many times things are pretty obvious, but then you, when you put it down and you do the modeling, a uh, lot of very interesting points come up. And in this particular paper, uh, kind of, uh, you know, taught generations of designers, uh, how do you formulate uh, your trade-offs properly so that um, so that you can get uh, you know very good design which is manufacturable that's what they are trying to do all right so what you see here on the bottom x-axis is on the left side you have binary deck uh, design and on the right side you have thermometer design this percentage 100 percent is telling you it's 100 percent thermometer versus is zero percent thermometer which means it's a binary and this is kind of telling you the segmentation part OK, going from left to the right. Now, if you just simply look at uh, INL specification. Okay. So INL specification um, doesn't really uh, depend on the architecture of your. Of your design, so uh, the INL is pretty flat when it comes to our design, right? So here we are seeing um, if I want INL of uh, 0.5 LSB, then this is the, the curve that I need to be on. And if I want INL of uh, one LSP, then I should be on this particular. Curve. OK, that's what it's telling me. Um, and uh, that is based on that 16 Sigma that that we we saw earlier, right? So that's our minimum size of the DAC. Now, no matter if you are on binary or thermometer, because you have to meet INL spec and you have to meet DNL spec. So INL will decide the minimum size of the DAC. Now, uh, if you look at just the DNL part, right? So if if I do the DAC completely binary right here, then the size of each element has to be really large. OK, as large as right here on this side. And if I do the thermometer, then the size of the device has to be doesn't have to be that large because I'll get a very good, uh, very good performance um, since I'm doing thermometer uh, part. Right. So this particular uh, line, which is connecting the two. Right here. Uh, kind of gives me, uh, according to the segmentation, how my, uh, for a given DNL of 0.5 LSB, what should be the size of my unit element? Okay, so if I go to the binary, then the size of the analog area is going to be very, very high to get certain uh, 0.5 LSB DNL. And if I just do a, a thermometer DAC, then the size analog um, of analog elements is going to be pretty small. However, these are the no, these are not the only things which decide the area of our land. Okay, the third part is amount of digital. Okay, so obviously when I do binary DAC, how much is the digital? Nothing, right? Because the bits which are coming in, you are directly driving the elements and you are turning them on and off. Because by definition they are binary and you are doing a binary control. So here you can see, okay, there is no uh, no no digital involved. Uh, but as you go to thermometer, as you start increasing the amount of thermometer coding, then your digital area will start going up like this. OK, so let me use a different color. So the digital area will go up like this. Like this. Now, as a designer, uh, what we would like to do is we would like to optimize the area. And we would like to get the uh, hit the specification. So you could be anywhere on this particular uh, line here, right here. The blue part and here OK. OK, if you land up on that blue spot, then your DAC is optimally designed. However, um, if I am, there is a very strong difference in the performance when I'm here versus here. OK, so if I'm at this particular point, then my DNL is going to be pretty small for a given um, you know, analog uh, analog area. OK, even though my digital contribution is slightly higher, but um, you know, we are adding things in the log scale. So uh, that's an acceptable increase in the area 
where I can get uh, excellent DNL performance. And the reason for that is if you get a better DNL, then you get a much better uh, harmonic distortion performance, your linearity performance. So you would trade off for a given area, you want to get the best uh, performance uh, that you can. And uh, so what they have done is they have pretty much chosen that particular one as an optimum uh, point of segmentation right here. OK, All right, something like this. Now let's kind of uh, start looking at uh, the actual result. Okay. So what they decided to do was, um, um, you know, eight plus two. So they wanted to do a 10 bit DAC. They said we will do eight bit thermo plus two bits for um, binary. Wait that. Okay. All right. So. Um, 8-bit thermometer means how many cells you will have uh, 2 to the power 8 number of cells which is 256 units so i need 256 units uh, they will turn on one at a time as i st start going up in this 8-bit uh, code here and these two bits will be basically um, uh, unit divided by 2 and unit divided by 4 so this represents B0, this represents B1, and these 256 units will be the result of um, B10, sorry, B9 to B2. So B9 to B2 will give me total uh, 256 units, okay? Uh, when I go from 000 to 1111, and that's what we do here, all right. So now kind of let's get into the, the design aspect of it. How do you how do you get into transistor level design? OK, so let's go through that. So um, as I said, uh, this is the way the overall architecture looks like. OK. So you have a um, digital input coming in, which is 10 bits. Coming in uh, from the digital piece. OK, and there is a clock input coming in. OK, so you have to do uh, buffering of the clocks and you have to synchronize all the. Um, you know when the signal is delivered to your current sources because you want all of them to turn on and off at the same time. You cannot have delay between them. They, anytime you have a kind of delay, then you have garbage coming out um, in your output spectrum, and that's bad news, okay? So here what they have done is since it's eight plus two, the two LSBs are shown here like this, okay? So this will have, um, you know, um, B0 and B1. So B1 will be two times B0, you get two units sizes. So you need three cells, but then you have one extra cell there which you can use for matching. OK, that's what you have. So the the desk, basically you have uh, the LSBs are straight away going through here in this part and they are controlling and the output of this LSB is is connected to this. Uh, these two output line. I'm going to show you the transistor level picture shortly. All right, now I have 256 cells. The 256 cells are uh, thermometer coded cells. OK, so based on um, B9 to B3. Uh, so uh, the rest of the bits from the digital, I would create a row decoding and column decoding. OK, so row decoding is over here. And the column decoding is over here. OK, and so this since we have 256 cells, we will have to control it with 16 rows and 16 columns, just like a memory cell. OK, so we would like to turn on and off these 256 cells using this row and column decoder. All right, so. Um, so for example, if I want to have, um, let's say I want to do 120, 128. Number of um, uh, 128 will be. Uh, you know, number of cells I want to turn them on. Then I would like to basically say that, okay, I'm going to turn on this entire area of cells. Okay. 
that's what I will turn on. And let's say I want to do 129. Then I would like to turn on all of them and also I would like to turn on this one last cell. That I'm showing here. OK, so to do this particular uh, level of control, you have to write a specific you have to you have to uh, this decoding part becomes critical. OK, and if you look at the cell, um, you will start understanding how this is done. So this is actual transistor level cell that they have created. And uh, as I said again, when you do these uh, designs, they are like um, you know, you design one unit and then you just step and repeat, step and repeat, step and repeat everywhere so that they all match very well. So in this particular case, uh, what are these things? I think uh, from 618, they should be pretty obvious to you. This is nothing but a cascode current source. OK, and these two are basically diff pair uh, switches, so they will either switch one way or the other, and this is our load resistor. OK, so whatever this unit current is, I that current will either flow to the left or to the right, depending upon what the digital control uh, LAP and LAN is. OK, and uh, so uh, the digital cell is also made uniform. And that digital cell is also incorporated in the in each each box over here that we are talking about. Each box contains this digital cell also. And uh, the row and column signals are are shown over here. Right here. Digital row and column signal. Now I would like you to like to pose one question to you. I don't want to give you all the answers. What I would like um, anyone in the class, um, you know, after reading the paper, I would like you to tell me why is there COL plus in this particular particular decoder? Okay, so. Um, and um, if you know why why COL plus is plus one is there, then please email uh, your answer um, and uh, and explain why a COL plus is there. This is kind of a detail that um, I would like to have you to understand because you will be designing um, your own DAC, okay? And you could be designing a cell like this, and you could be stepping and repeating the same cell every. But you need to understand why this COL one uh, plus one is there, okay? So this is kind of a homework assignment for you uh, to explain why uh, why this is there. OK, and um, the clue that I will give you is over here. How do you do this? And that will give you the clue. How do I go from 128 to 129? OK, now um, so uh, having said that, let's kind of take a look at the rest of the paper um, is uh, OK, this is another piece which is uh, very interesting because, you know, DAC design or ADC design is not just about a schematic design, but also about layout design. And in this particular case, um, what is really going on? OK, let's try to understand. So um, this particular circuit that you're seeing here. OK, uh, first of all, I would like you to realize that. Um, this bottom part. Here is nothing but a cascode. Cascode. And this is something that you have done in 618 and other classes, right? And the one on the on the right here, uh, on, on the top here, what is that called? And um, if you if you look through the notes, you will realize that this is called a high swing cascode current mirror. So if I'm talking, whatever I'm talking is gibberish to you, then you have to look at um, 618 notes on current mirrors. OK, real fundamentals in analog design. OK, um, and the point I'm trying to teach is um, you look at schematics and immediately you start doing pattern matching. So here in this case, I'm just teaching you how to do pattern matching um, and you should be able to converse in um, NMOS pattern matching as well as PMOS pattern matching. OK, you should be able to flip your brain upside down uh, to 
to understand either of them. OK, all right. Now, if you notice something, um, there is something called global biasing and there is something called local biasing. OK, let me explain what that means. So um, if you remember those 256 cells, right? Those 256 cells, I cannot just go, you know, one row at a time or one column at a time from left to right. What will happen is you will get a pretty bad mismatch behavior because, for example, um, if the. Okay. Let's say this is the thickness of our oxide, OK? And um, in, a, in a chip, you can you never get perfect uh, oxide thickness. Sometimes you can get uh, like, you know, the oxide is filtered like this. Sometimes it can be this way. Sometimes it can be that way, right? So imagine imagine this particular part right here. And if I take a cross section of this, it can be like this, the oxide thickness. I'm exaggerating it like this. Now, if I just do from left to right, then the transistor property on the right side will be a lot worse or on the left side will be also a lot worse, right? So you will have a gradient and this is called a gradient effect. So to uh, account for these gradient errors, we do something called common centroid layout in our analog design. What that means is we will split the current array in such a way that um, no matter which code you are in, you will pick uh, devices from different different regions and you get an averaging effect of the gradient. OK, so that's the trick that we like to use um, using common centroid. So this global biasing and local biasing is to enable that. OK, so uh, the global biasing basically you have one single current input and you you create a copy n copies of that current on top right here, which is for global biasing and each one of them will go to different different locations. Uh, in the center of the cell and then from that center of the cell you locally bias multiple uh, regions. OK, that's what you're doing. So for example, if you see here uh, these 256 cells, for example, right? They are um, they are not going to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight like that, right? Because if you do that, then you will have a large gradient error and you will have a bad INN um, because as you go from low code to high code, depending upon the gradient, you will you know you will see really skewed performance. So what you do then is you split. So you start with one here and then you go for two over here and then the three is over here and then the four is here and then the five is here. So you can see that you're kind of maintaining the centroid of of this particular structure as you move around from one to eight. OK, so that's what you do by doing uh, this kind of, um, you know, um, randomization between the different different cells. The next thing you see on the on the right side is also a analog technique that all of us like to use. And this is something I explained earlier is what we like to do is we use dummies. Dummies are cells which are not in use, but they are there just for the physical presence. So for example, the the all the dashed uh, all the all the cells which are out here, the ones which I'm which I'm highlighting right now, they are all dummies they are not being used but what they do is if i look at a cell which is here versus here in the center okay it provides the same environment to the left and right and uh, top and bottom of that cell okay so the dummies basically equalize um, the 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 features which are around the cell so to give you better matching okay so this is what uh, I think somebody had asked me a question about dummies a while ago, so this kind of gives you a visual proof of that. So you're kind of bumping up the area by putting these cells because they are not useful, but you are improving the performance because um, you know you are you are going to make matching better. You may think that this is being superstitious, but actually you do see uh, improvement in performance because uh, the edge effects can kill you as you go as you go to 28 nanometer or lower. You know those kind of technologies. All right. So uh, that's pretty much it about this particular paper. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop and take questions before I move on to the next paper. So this is the die photo area and here you can see this is the DAC over here and there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff, uh, you know, over there to support the DAC. And the major measured values are phenomenal. As you can see here, you can see 
even for a 10-bit DAC, you get DNL that's less than uh, 0.1 LSP. Okay, and INL is uh, less than 0.2 LSP. So, um, you know, really good looking DAC in terms of performance. Okay, and you can also see the uh, the spurious free dynamic range. Spurious free dynamic range is this particular uh, difference between these two. So this is a spurious signal, unwanted signal uh, that you will see at the output. Uh, and that will be result of how long nonlinear your DAC is. Um, so, um, so this is probably a second harmonic. This is third harmonic, something like that, right? Uh, so you measure the difference between the two. Uh, and that is 73 dB here, which is really good Okay, in that sense. And then here again, we are looking at spurious free dynamic range of 60 dB, where uh, you are going close to the Nyquist uh, frequency uh, by two. Okay. All right. So, um, what else can I show you? This is, yeah, overall performance. And this is what they look like CHLIN and class mult. All right. So, I'll wait right here. Um, and uh, I've covered a lot of material in the last hour, so I want to answer your questions. So please raise your hands and I will answer. If something is not clear about my explanation, then we will, we will talk about it. Go ahead. Be here, go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, so I had a doubt in figure nine. Yeah, I have turned on the video. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, figure nine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Tell me. Yeah. Uh, so, so it says the area for binary is uh, higher than thermometer like if it's completely binary then completely thermometer uh, but in thermometer DAC we are using the smaller unit cells more number of times uh, so why is that different yeah excellent question I'm glad you asked me that question I mean I couldn't have um, I could have programmed somebody to ask me that question okay so let's walk through that okay um, so what happens is the following Okay, let's look at this particular table. And this is the table we learned um, in the previous class. Okay, so uh, look at these, these numbers here. So if I just do a thermometer coded DAC, okay, what is my INL? 16 sigma. INL, oh sorry, I'm sorry. INL is 16 sigma and DNL, what is my DNL? Uh, just sigma. Sigma, okay. So the DNL is a single sigma. And that is basically one unit because I'm only at any time I'm only adding one unit, right? Got it? Okay. In okay. case of uh, binary DAC, what is my INL? Oh, sorry, what is my DNL? Uh, yeah, 32 sigma. 32. Why 32? Uh, because of the switching of uh, like many cells. Yeah, yeah, time. yeah, yeah. So if, if we, what we have is when we go from um, think about it this way, right? Um, if it's a 10-bit DAC, then what would be, you start with, uh, let's let's say it's capacitor, for example. You start with the unit C, then you will start with 2C. And what will be the last cell? Uh, 2 raised to 10 minus, yeah, 2 raised to 10 C. What would be 2 raised to 10? Uh, 1024. Uh, so 2 raised to 10 minus 1. Yeah, so 9. I'm talking about this part. So C, 2C, what will be the last? Uh, uh, two, 5 and 2C. For 10 bits, right? Yeah, for 10 bits, yeah. Uh, yeah, so 2 raised to 9 times C. 2 raised to 9 is what? Um, five and two. If I'm not wrong. Okay. So what I'm talking about is one C, two C, four C, eight C, and then let's just do it brute force. Sixteen C. Then what would be the next one? Thirty two C. 
Okay, and then 64 C, correct? Yeah. And then um, what would be the last one? Uh, how many did we get? Uh, three, six, seven. 64 ka double kya hai? 128. And then? 256. And then last one will be? 5 and 2. 5 and 2 C. Okay, do you get what I'm trying to say here? So these will be the unit cells. Got it? So we will have... Um, uh, uh, 5 and 2. Um, and then, uh, okay, uh, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. For a 10 bit time. Okay, so when I'm switching in the middle, what is really going on? We have 1024, 1023 units switching actually. Hmm. Correct. And uh, so that's like a, a instead of one element, now I have uh, 10, uh, 102, uh, uh, 24 elements switching. Okay. So then uh, this times sigma square will be my total switching that will happen, right? Each one will give me sigma square. Hmm? Since I have 102, for sake of the discussion, right? Let's assume 1024 instead of 1023. Correct? Yeah. So I have 1024 element switching. Then it will be 1024 times sigma square. That will be the total standard DVA, uh, sigma in I. This would be your uh, sigma DNL. DNL. Correct? Yeah. So what is sigma DNL now? What is square root of uh, 1024? Uh, 2 raised to 5, 32. 32. Okay. What do we see here? Yeah, 32. Okay. I just wanted to go through this intentionally so that you get the point. So that 32 sigma comes from here. Okay. So that's what we got. Now let's kind of walk backwards. So if I have if I have a thermometer DAC, okay, with a certain standard deviation, sigma. And let's say that requires a unit size of the device okay so for example then if i go to a binary weighted DAC, what should be the area of that device based on pelgrom's law okay so i have to pop it up by sigma square yeah uh -huh. so now the area of that unit has to be 1024 times larger to get exact same dnl performance okay got okay you. So that's what this curve is representing here. Okay. Yes, sir. Got so you. if I have a unit size here, then in this particular case, I just need 1024 times a unit. So this is insane. If I do the binary DAC, and if I want the exact same DNL performance that the, uh, I mean, if a unit is an ant, then the binary DAC is an elephant to get the same matching performance. I, I hope you can imagine imagine this. Okay. Yeah. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Omar. You can ask. Uh, yeah, uh, sir. So that uh, A unit area does that include the digital part as well, or oh, is that something separate? Analog area only. We are only talking okay. about analog area. Okay, and then the thermal requires the uh, thermometer requires the maximum digital area. So how exactly. does that add exactly. up? Exactly. Yeah, and that so digital how... area that we can see here, okay, is going up. Sorry, that digital area will go up like this okay so the overall digital area will look like this o not overall digitally overall area of the DAC will be summation of everything okay okay so it will look like this so um, you know you kind of want to land up at this point 
because this gives me really good performance and you're pretty much close to the minimum area for a given spec. I mean, you will argue with me that, oh, why don't we do this? And I am reducing my digital area, right? But I really don't want, I don't really care for digital area, right? I can bump up digital area because I want performance always. That performance, you want the best performance. Because you're just due to manufacturing a chip, you know, you want to be always on the safe side when it comes to performance. So you don't design your chips at the boundary line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sir, one more thing. Uh, so oh, this mis yes. So does this mismatch comes from our uh, layout that we uh, model in the computer, or is it something fabrication related? Yeah. So mismatch has two components. One is our own stupidity and how bad layout guys we are, right? And the second one is so the one is man-made and one is god-made. <laughs> so the man-made ones are, hey, you know, let's say, uh, uh, let's say, you know, I'm supposed to match, uh, match these two, right? So what, what's the best way to match the two, uh, two devices? You want to keep them right next to each other, very close to each other, right? So both of them see the same, same um, radiations or whatever which are defining them, right? But then uh, you said, hey, what the hell, you know, I'll do it this way. Okay, let's say I did it this way. Then, of course, they will not match because one of them is horizontal, other one is vertical. So that's why I said man-made. So this would be a man-made stupidity. So don't do that. So you want to make sure that all of them like look really nice, beautiful, you know, aligned in a nice array-like fashion. Then you're good. Now rest is left is, you know, uh, whatever you get from the foundry process, right? Because uh, um, when whenever you go for foundry, there is uh, some uh, iron implantation going on, some lithography going on. I'm kind of vaguely, they are also man-made, but I'm kind of saying that, that that's not under designer control, right? Okay. So they will kind of create, create a lot of variations and your oxide thickness will be slightly sloping. All those things are very, very small, but they are, even though they are small, they are, uh, they are quantifiable, okay? to the order of few percentage points. So those are kind of uh, random mismatches. Uh, so what we like to do as designers is we will accept randomization and then we will try to um, do things on the chip so that we can average out the effect of randomization. And how do you do that? You kind of fool, um, fool the, uh, the thing by uh, doing it in four quadrants, okay? And then you get common centroid effect, so that you know the averaging effect will happen uh, between. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, if I if I just do uh, if I have two transistors, let's say, right? So, let's say this is one transistor, and let's say this is second transistor. So, this is the gate. Okay. So, if I just draw these two transistors like this, okay. Now, let's say we take a cross section out here okay so the cross section will basically you see a gate and you will see um, this is our oxide ideally i want the oxide to be really flat okay unfortunately the oxide has some slope okay so the slope is such that in reality it looks like this so in reality i'm going to see Okay, so this is the silicon uh, or rather the well and things like that, substrate, and this is my um, poly defining the transistor. Okay, I'm exaggerating things to show you the gradient effect. Now the transistor B and transistor A, they will not match very well. Yeah. Okay, this is because of the process variation. So what do we do? What we do is, okay, all right, if that's what you got, then I'll um, I'll beat you. How do I beat you? What I will do is I will divide this transistor in two pieces, like this. Okay. And now what I'll do is I will. Um, there are many ways I can draw the transistors. I can do A B B A. Let's call it A by two, B by two, B by two, 
a by 2. Do you understand what I'm doing here? Uh, no. OK, let me explain. So since I uh, chop the transistor in two pieces. OK, let's call the each transistor. This will be a by 2 and this will be a by 2. This will be b by 2 and this will be b by 2. Understood? So we're just going to physically separate them. now. OK, OK, so the current structure is looking like this. Current structure is A by 2. Sorry. And B by 2, B by 2. OK, this is what the current structure is. Yes. OK, what is the centroid of A? It should be right in the middle here. Yes. And the centroid of B is right here. So if the centroid is different, then you're not going to get the matching between them. And that's where common centroid design comes in. OK, so how do you do common centroid? What I will do now is I will draw the transistor in such a way that I have A by 2 and then I have B by 2. Then I have B by 2 and then I have A by 2. So I have just separated the transistors. Don't worry about the connections. Those we will take care in metal. OK, so if I did that, then what is the centroid of B? Centroid of B is here. What is the centroid of A? At the same location. Again, the same place. So we have a common centroid. Yes. So this will definitely match very well. OK. So that's what I mean by common centroid. And if you want to be really, really paranoid, then you also do this. You can do A by 2. You do A by 2, B by 2, B by 2, A by 2. So we, you, you kind of draw the transistors like this. OK, and then you get again, you know, from all directions you get protection. Now it doesn't matter if the gradient is this way or this way. Centroid is still the same. Okay. I hope this was clear because this is an important, um, you know, chip design. Uh, whatever you're going to do, if you end up doing that, it's not about just doing things on the computer and looking at the models. It's all about visualization. And it's all about how you draw those transistors on the on the um, on the on the layout. And you know, as analog mixed signal digital designers, you are an artist. You know, when it comes to all these uh, things, uh, it's not just like something you do on the computer and you're saying, okay, everything will work work out. You have to look at this part because this is the layout is where what I like to call it the rubber meets the road. You know, yes. so your your chip is as good as your layout not as good as what you design on the computer. So that the layout has to be good. Uh, it's like, you know, you have a Ferrari, but you have lousy tires and it's going to feel pretty bad compared to even a Tata Nano, right? So you got to have good tires and good tires means good layout. I'm kind of extrapolating the analogies here so that you get the point. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, so this was a layout uh management on the transistor level so but do we have to do anything on the larger scale regarding the blocks placement absolutely absolutely this kind of goes everywhere you know uh, i'm just teaching you the the real fundamentals okay and as you go higher and higher up there are so many other things we're going to learn as we go along in the class okay, okay. there is be a lot of digital switching noise how do you connect the power supplies how do you make sure that the substrate noise doesn't come in and screw your performance up? So all those things are going to come as we go along. But this is kind of, I'm slowly uh, kind of getting all of you to learn about, um, you know, why layout is so important when it comes to all these designs. And once you master this understanding, then you you will do really well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions before we move? Yes, sir. Abbas. Yes, Abbas. Uh, hello, sir. 
सर कैन यू गो टू फिगर नाइन अरे बाप सर टू मी द ऑप्टिमल पॉइंट इज वेर द एरिया एंड द डीएनएल मीट्स बिकॉज वी आर ट्रेडिंग ऑफ बिटवीन द एरिया एंड द डीएनएल एंड प्लस वॉट एन एडवांटेज वी गेट यर so this is this should be the optimal point correct where the two lines meet yeah yeah i mean i'm just telling you right i just told you this whole whole thing what is the optimal point is the area is fairly constant over here anywhere uh so it is twice isn't it between uh, so i'm i'm pointing that this point uh, can you just this where the two lines meet just below the pink so the below, one that i circled no no where the two lines meet the area digital this one yes sir so here the area is twice half of the area no oh, but you I missed one it. part right see what what you missed is um in this particular segment here okay the area is decided by my inl because i want to get an inl of 1 lsb at least so that okay. gives me this particular device size that's why i'm stuck okay 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 yeah okay good good okay. question yes. anyone else anvesh sir how the speed is achieved over here how does what speed 500 million samples per second there was a figure also yeah 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 which for which figure are you talking about at the bottom it was there so how the speeds i mean high speed dscs are made dac are mm -hmm. so i'm not able to get your question is your question so my question is about about this take a sample per second pardon me sir I yeah yeah for what is no what is your question my question is that uh, how all these parameters define the speed how are you going to achieve, achieve good speed of that yeah, yeah 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 i mean it's like you know you you start your design at low frequencies and then you you really want to you know the the device sizes are decided by this inl and dnl at dc or low frequencies okay and what they have done is they have pushed the limit in terms of technology uh, to as high speed as they can they can go to and the speed is pretty much how quickly can you turn on and off the transistor so there is nothing magic about it okay what is the core cell of a dac tell me what is the core cell of the dac is this okay so now does this uh, let me erase all the stuff first so what decides the speed you tell me do you think this digital will decide the speed sir i think the analog will decide the speed okay good because how quickly basically what what the speed is decided by what is the waveform i'm going to get at lap and lan okay yes because i have to have the form that looks like this to turn on and off these switches here yes okay. sir yeah so that's what will decide your speed how quickly can you squish the current from one place to another yes and sir uh, one more thing regarding the layout design mm -hmm. suppose uh, we are designing a chip that consists of all uh, different attributes like AD, adcs dacs some op amps also so uh, then uh, for layout uh, do we separately design the layouts and then combine it together or we <laughs> design it as a whole uh okay good i mean you ask like a um uh, if i was teaching this class in us i would have said million dollar question 
but since we are doing it in here in india we say one crore question how about that okay so let's say um, uh, you asked a karodpati question so what is the, the uh, what anvesh asked right now is so how do you really do this stuff right because you are telling me all about these layouts and everything and uh, so uh, i want to walk through let's let's say anvesh is Uh, what's your favorite company? What's your dream company, Anvesh? Assuming that you are going to work in this space, uh, because you asked me so many questions, I am assuming that you will start working in analog mix signal area. Is that true? Yes, sir. You would like to, right? So, what yes. would be your dream company? Where would you like to work for? Texas Instruments. Okay, ठीक है. Texas T I चला देंगे. So T I, let's say uh, Anvesh went to T I, and I just want you to imagine. what he is what is the torture that he is going to go through when he joins ti okay so the his boss comes in next day and tells him that i want you to design a 1 giga sample per second dac hmm? with so much inl so much dnl this should be my performance that performance right and this is what a real time uh, design uh, practice will be so since you are working at ti your life is kind of easy because there will be some dedicated people who are doing layout for you okay so there is a design team and then there is a layout team if you are working in a startup not really true because there the designers would like to have control uh, the designers would like to control the destiny of the company let me put it this way in a startup right so in ti um, you have some freedom basically uh, you can you can do the design schematic simulations etc and uh, there is somebody else who is doing the layout for you i mean not necessary all the time many companies allow you to do the layout itself okay but um, it's it, it really depends on the the corporate strategy uh, but generally big companies they like to have they have like separate layout teams who are really good at that part okay so they are doing layout day in day out um, and uh, whereas uh, small companies who are like um, very nimble and agile in product development they like their designers to do the layout because the designers have everything in their brain right so why do you want to transfer that information to somebody else and have them do the layout and then you correct the layout again instead why don't you do the layout yourself so that can happen so since uh, anvesh is lucky he is working at ti he would do his schematic design first so he would choose certain w by ls and um, and then he goes to uh, the layout guy um, and um, the the layout guy is robert he is i just picked a name out of the hat and robert looks at the layout and he says that this is not going to work you know you need to fix these device sizes so the layout person will uh, robert will tell him uh, that you know i cannot divide this size by 2 or 4 something like that because the layout people also want to split the devices to do improve matching and things like that so you will have to go back and change the device sizes so that it is it is more layoutable okay so that you can get unit cell design very easily so if you are a good analog designer you will definitely um, you know do your design in such a way that everything is unit cell based so let's say you did that so the layout uh, designer robert uh, will lay out a skeleton floor plan of what he is going to do and he is going to come back to you and he is going to say do you like this floor plan so you're going to say hey this supply line is too small here there is a long route the inputs are coming in this way the clock is overlapping on the inputs not good can you fix it can you fix it such that the inputs and clocks don't overlap with each other the outputs go out in a different direction input comes in from the left output goes out on the right clocks come in the middle digital control i don't care where they come the supply is on the top ground is on the bottom something like that so you give him a lot of feedback like this he comes back with a design and he comes back with a result of that okay then you take that and you do some simulations and those are called parasitic extraction simulations so you will extract only the resistance you will extract only the capacitance and you will extract r and c together from your layout and then you will run some simulations and you will see that you meet the specifications or not if you don't then you will make changes okay and then you will go back to him and he will be very unhappy but you go buy him cup of coffee and you know calm him down he said that's what i need so he agrees and then he does the design uh, so you have to in all this discussion you have to respect your layout person quite a lot okay you have to kind of otherwise they get very unhappy very quickly and if the layout person gets unhappy that means he's a good layout designer that's my rule of thumb 
So that's kind of the way it works. Okay, so you go back and forth a couple of times and then you come to an optimum design, which you finally lay out. Again, you have to run all the checks and make sure that everything is good from the performance point of view. It's a long winded answer, but I, I hope you appreciate. Yes, sir. I hope I'm you sure. join TI and once you join TI in, in one month, I would like you to call me back and let me know if this was true or not. Yes, sir. If they give you a regulator to design, then you know that, okay, Yes, sir. So uh, I have also talked with my friends who are already in TA. They are also saying the same thing. What are they, they saying? Also have, they also have a dedicated uh, analog engineers team as well as layout engineers team. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank Good. You. Any other question? Abbas has. Oh, I'm sorry. I we just went through the whole um, almost a whole whole class for just one paper. I had four papers that I wanted to talk about. What should we do, Anamika? Maybe we give them for self. Yeah, research. let's give, let's give them the papers to read so that. Um, they come back. OK, Abbas, go ahead. Uh, sir, I have a doubt in that uh, layout thing that you showed. The dummies, I did not understand why did we put an extra layer of dummy after uh, an external dummy? Again, there's mm -hmm. one more layer of it. Mm -hmm. What's the need for that? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a good analogy for you. So, OK, I got a great analogy for you. OK, think about it this way. Let's say we buy a cake. What cake do you like, Abbas? Chocolate. Huh? Chocolate cake. Chocolate cake. OK, Abbas likes chocolate cake. And which, where do you buy the cake from? Where do you buy your cake from? Marwan or Monjani. Hey, next time you better get some Marwan from me when you're back on campus. That's my favorite place too. OK, so let's say Abbas buys a cake. Uh, from Merwan, okay, and the cake looks like this. Okay, let me do a better job. And this is like really important question. Um, because again, you know, as analog designers or mixed signal designers, you have to think in 3D, three dimensions. Okay, so think about this. So I'm going to draw this picture of the cake. Okay, Abbas, how many people do you have brothers and sisters? One brother. Okay, let's say you have one brother and two sisters for now. Okay. For now, for the sake of discussion. I know you wouldn't like to have two more sisters in the house, uh, but uh, because then all the love will get divided, right? So I understand the pain. Now, now four of you want to have this cake. Okay, and um, <clears throat> then... Um, we want to give the cake to each person such that it, the cake has to look exactly identical. How would you cut the cake? In four pieces. Uh, passing from the center. Yeah. Center, okay, okay. Um, so what, what Abbas is saying is that he's going to cut the cake like this and something like this, right? Okay, now each piece of the cake, is it going to be identical? Yeah, I suppose. Like no, 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 no. If I, if I take the cake cross section, it's going to look like this. Right, so I have this extra piece on the outside. Okay, okay, yeah. Right, so the each piece is not going to be identical. It will have difference because some uh, one piece will have have this piece and one will have this piece, right? Okay. There will be chocolate covering which is extra on the sides. Okay, okay. Got it, got it. Got not, good. not good. I want it to be identical. So how would you cut it then? Diagonally. Huh? Anyway, 
yeah, I mean, I think we are going overboard with the cake analogy now. Uh, but I think you get the point. What I would do is, let's say this is my cake, right? Then I would I would cut the cake like this. Two pieces. Okay. Okay. Now each one of the piece, which is here. So this piece, this piece, this piece, and this piece, they are identical now. Right? Yeah. If I take a cross section of the case, it will have a nice juicy chocolate on the top, crispy chocolate on the bottom, and then there is a puffy centerpiece right here. Okay. Each unit is exactly identical. Okay. Okay. Now, do you get the point? Why do you need yeah. dummy on the side? Yes. Okay. So, for all practical purposes, these dummies, you know, they are just dummies, these side pieces. Okay. We want each transistor to look exactly identical. So what we do, we end up wasting area. So what we say is that I want this, I want this, I want this, and I want this. Then I would be going aboard, or like saying that I'm going to put all these cells like this. Now each transistor looks up and looks down. It looks the same way looks left and looks right. It's exactly same. Right? What is around that transistor? So that transistor gets exact same thing on left, right, up, down, uh, you know, in that sense, right? Top, bottom. Same thing is over here. Look up, look down, something like that. So you can, you can imagine this, that the, the center pieces will have exact same surrounding. And these will match very well. But if I just do four transistors like this, right? And then there is a routing going over here. And then there is another, another cap that's drawn over here. Okay. So suddenly this transistor and this transistor, they will not look the same because this guy sees this routing, this guy sees this capacitor on the top, things like that. So, so uh, we we like to kind of make sure that we draw these dummies so that nothing else comes close and all the center pieces are kind of like identical pieces of cake. So there is an extra layer of dummy in the paper that they have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they are they are really, really paranoid because the effect, edge effects are lasting even to the uh, second layer. Okay, and that is okay. true when it comes to, when you go to 28 nanometer, you know, 14 nanometer, as you keep going down, 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 then, um, uh, then you know those effects come into play. A simplest effect is, let's say you drew the transistor. Like this, right? And um, so uh, let's look at the this portion of the transistor. I mean, let me see, which is the best way to draw it. So this is my gate and this is my diffusion. And this is gate. Okay. okay. So when you look at this particular interface or even um, this particular interface, it's very dependent on what's next to it. So what you like to do is you make sure that particular um, either this or this Basically, every every side of the transistor, right? This is the transistor area. So you want to make sure that you look here, look here, look here, and look here. It should all look the same. Even if there is a small difference, then the transistor's performance will be slightly different. Okay. Yes, got it. I hope you visualize uh, what's going on. Uh, it's all about visualizing the transistor. You literally have to sit on top of a transistor and then you have to look everywhere and see how it looks like. And um, you want to, you know, we are kind of 
extremely paranoid and we like everything to be matched properly. We like to route match everything. We like to match the capacitance. We like to match the number of VRs. Talk about it. You know, that's what people do for living. So. Okay, sir. Thank you. So um, I think I have already run uh, beyond the time. Uh, unfortunately, I could only cover one one particular paper. It's okay. This particular paper is uh, is a is a really good landmark paper that all of you should review. I'm going to give you um, uh, three more papers to review, and um, you know you can kind of um, base your ideas uh, if you want to do a design. Uh, the DAC design that we are going to ask you to do as part of your uh, project, uh, I would like you to choose these various ideas uh, from, from these papers. Okay, And uh, we would reward you if you come up with your own ideas or you try something different. Okay, So um, that if you can add some unknown element to your design, we would really appreciate it because that's what you're supposed to do as part of this class. OK, so the basic one paper we have covered, um, I'll just before I stop, I'll just tell you which are the other papers. One is a self calibration technique. OK, so this paper was also a landmark paper. This was for um, I don't know how many of you know CD players. Do you know what a CD player is? Omkar? Do you know what a CD is? Anvesh? Uh, no, sir. You don't know no. what a CD is? You've never no, seen a CD? My God. What this world has come to. Anvesh, you don't know what a CD is? Compact disc. Uh, CD player. Uh, I know. I heard CD. CD. You have player. heard about. Yeah, I know CD player. Yes. You know CD player, right? So CDs uh, in old days, right? Um, when I used to talk, we used to talk about this ten years ago. It was all uh, gramophone records that we talk about, and you know vacuum tube radios. But for you guys, um, even CD players is very old technology. So that's see how technology is evolving, right? So CD player is you have one disc, compact disc, on which you used to have music, and then you could purchase it um, in the market. Nowadays, you don't do that. You just buy, I don't think anybody buys MP3s anymore. You just get a subscription and you're happy, right? So, um, so the CD player is basically where the music is encoded as, uh, as, as bits, and then you play the CD, and then you... Basically, you need a digital to analog converter, which is what will come through your speaker. So the resu the fidelity of that D to A converter will decide how good quality your CD player is. So these guys, um, you know, Groven, um, uh, Groenweld, um, Chauvinar, and uh, Tamir and uh, Bastiansen, they are from Philips. So they came up with really neat idea about how do you do self calibrated converters because here you need 16 bit type of resolution uh, for your DAC. A typical DAC we can get in a process is maybe 8 to 12 bits, 8 to 10 bits. They have achieved 16 bit uh, resolution with using this self calibration technique. It's a very innovative technique, um, very easy to understand. I would like you to read this paper. Okay. Um, this, the third one is, uh, is an idea about um, uh, something called output impedance compensation. It will show up just a second. Okay. Looks like it's not showing up. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, you think that all the innovations in DAC has already happened long time ago, right? 30, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. This is a paper from September 2020. So this is last year's paper. And they have come out with a neat idea. Um, Anamika brought this to my attention, so I thought I'll show it to you. And um, so if you if you look at this paper, uh, they have a pretty neat technique called output impedance uh, cancellation or compensation technique. Um, and it's worth reading what they're doing. So these are all simple ideas. You know how simple ideas can uh, achieve great results. So that's why we have chosen these papers. OK. Yeah, the, there is a lot of delay here. Um, I'm showing you a picture and you're not able to see it. Yeah, so this is the picture. So how you fix the output impedance. Um, so you can you can read this paper as well. 
And the last paper that we have given here is uh, is by uh, my. Uh, he was on my thesis committee. Uh, his name is uh, Professor uh, Richard Carley. I was at Carnegie Mellon and he is he is still professor there. Um, so he came up with this uh, really neat way of um, noise shaping. Um, the mismatches and it's called dynamic element mismatch. OK. Sorry, dynamic element matching technique that he came up with, and that's been used by uh, almost every DAC design that you can think of. So this is another landmark paper that you can look at. Um, and there is one more paper, but um, I won't go through it since we ran out of time. So we will share these paper links with you. I would like you to read them on your own and um, uh, let the questions come up. If you if you can ask questions on our uh, class website, then uh, then we will try to explain each one of them and give you answers. So from next next class onwards, uh, we will change our gears to we will start going into the A to D converter directions. OK. Uh, Anamika uh, or uh, Anik, are there any announcements? Uh, no, sir. For now, there are no announcements. They will submit their inverter assignment by this. Right, Sunday. Isn't there a quiz uh, sometime? Said there next week, uh, Tuesday. Next Tuesday there is a quiz, right? Yes. Okay. Ninth, ninth, ninth February. Ninth. Okay. Okay. All right. So that should cover everything till today. Till today. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. I apologize for not completing everything, but uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion in terms of the real life analog mix signal design. Any questions? I'm still around, so if you want to ask me questions. All right. There are no uh, yeah, thank you.